Without further ado, it is my privilege to introduce none other than Ashley Liebig. Um, many of you may know her from social media and or Twitter, where she has single-handedly developed and founded a community of pre-hospital nurses, technicians, paramedics, and EMTs to really hone in on evidence-based medicine and focus on high-quality critical care. But more so, she also has a deep exploration of the art of presentation, the style of learning so that you can actually walk away and take home these nuggets and pearls and incorporate them into your medical practice. And last but not least, those difficult topics in medicine that sometimes we prefer not to talk about. Okay, you guys... You guys are ready? I'm just going to, if you don't mind, I'm just going to hit send on this last email here. And All right. I think we're probably ready. Oh. Hey, Ash. Grandma called again from the Hold nursing on. home. One She's second. Kind of crazy. I don't know if somebody needs to go sit with her or um, if we need to pull her out of there or what. So can you call me back and let me know what we need to do about that? Okay. Thanks. Okay. Hey, Ash. Mike. Can you do me a favor and uh, take a look at this slide deck? I think it's kind of a raging dumpster fire, but I need some no BS feedback on it okay thanks bye okay. hey mom can you drop off my basketball shorts to addison's house by seven please uh. yeah i'll do a venti pumpkin spice latte oh hold on a second hey ashley it's tyler sorry missed your call got a second to look at your projected budget for next year uh we need to talk i don't think that's gonna work i need you to run a comb through that sharpen your pencil and give me back some new numbers I hope that's not too much to ask. Take care. Hope the family's well. Talk to you soon. Bye. Hey, girl. What do you want to drink tonight? Red, white, rosé, frosé? Let me know ASAP. Hey, Ashley. It's Chief Rickinson. Hey, uh, let's see if you can give me a call. I got one of my guys who got spit on. He thinks it got in his eyes, and he's freaking out over here, and I don't really know what to tell him. You're good at this stuff. Give me a shout back. Ash, hey. Um, I know you are probably slammed at work today, but um, when you get a second, if you can give me a call, I have this weird, like, pimple-looking thing, like, the key line area, Queen Bee region. Um, I mean, it's probably nothing, like, maybe just an ingrown hair or something, but I just got thinking, like, what if Mr. Hotness is actually Mr. Herpes and did not communicate well when we chatted about that? Um, so, yeah. Kind of freaking out a little bit, trying to stay calm about it. Probably nothing, but when you get a hot second, if you could just call me back, I would appreciate that. Okay, love you. Have a great day. Bye. Hey, Ash. It's Weingart. Give me a call. I've been looking over your notes on the decision fatigue stuff. Not really sure you're going in the right direction. We should talk. Okay. I hope you're not planning on waiting until the last minute because we got a lot of things to talk about. No problem. All right. <laughs> hey, Ash. Grandma call. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, well... That's super awkward. So the day hasn't even begun. And I have seven people, all with some need, some ask, some question, some debate. Everyone wants something from me. And even the fun stuff, the rosé all day, still requires a decision. Can you do this? Can you solve this? What do you think about this? all added to my priorities of all the list of things that I already have to do and that I've already set for my day and my plan. So I find myself here often at my desk, task and priorities abundant. When I'm maxed out, I'm taxed out, I'm tired. But the reason I'm tired isn't because of lack of sleep or even because I was, got in late last night. I'm tired from all of the decisions. And surely you're thinking like, oh my God, Ashley, suck it up. You have a couple of voicemails and a list of stuff to do. Decisions aren't that hard. It's not that big of a deal. But let me ask you this. Have you ever been to the grocery store and they ask you that question like paper or plastic at the end of the day? And probably because you're all good stewards of the environment, you all say paper every time. But you had a challenge coming up with that answer. Or have you ever gotten really angry at the gas station because you had to select all the buttons after your debit? Is this a debit card? Um, do you, would you like a receipt? Would you like a fuel additive? Would you like a car wash? No, I just want some freaking gas. 
Or at the grocery store, do you find yourself grabbing snacks at the end aisles, those little impulse buys, because even though you already have a grocery cart full of groceries? All of this is because we have something called decision fatigue, which refers to the deteriorating quality of decisions made by an individual after a long session of decision making. A long session of decision making? What does that mean? Like every day. Every day we make something like 35,000 decisions. Wouldn't it be great if we got paid by decision? That would be amazing, right? So while decisions mean great things like freedom and power and choice, just like Uncle Ben said in Spider-Man, with great power also comes great responsibility. So imagine, you've got a book of matches, right? And you're going out into the wilderness to do whatever it is that, I don't know, naturey people do out in the wilderness. And you have a book, the book of matches is your fire source, so you have to be careful with how you use it. Every time we light a match and burn that energy source, we have to be mindful of that choice. And this isn't indifferent to making our decisions. If you have 12 nights of camping planned and only 10 matches, that resource becomes really precious, doesn't it? Every single decision we make has a biological price. It requires our energy, our ATP, our glucose. And just like the matches, they are not infinite. After you've exhausted your decision matches, you might not have the energy for things like impulse control or a way to effectively manage your reactions. So when it comes to decision making, you might make those impulsive decisions at the grocery store. Or maybe you do nothing. Have you ever just, at the end of the day, like, I cannot make another single decision today, right? You refuse to make the decision. It's called decision avoidance because you're worried about the potential consequences. So, as a little sidebar, this also sounds really familiar to chronic stress, which, oh, by the way, you all have, likely, because you work already in a high-stakes environment. So one of the symptoms of chronic stress, which I know my friend is going to talk about probably later, is that you have difficulty making decisions and with your attention span because your prefrontal cortex gets hijacked by, because it's soaked in cortisol all the time, and so your amygdala takes over. And so right up here where all the critical thinking and decision-making takes place, not for you, my friend, not for you, you lose the ability to do that, that complex thought process because of chronic stress all the time. So if we look at this another way, who in here is a marksman? Who in here has ever fired a weapon before, I guess, should be my question. Okay, a few of you. All right. So I'm from Texas, and I was in the Army. And I am a pretty badass shot, I must say. So I have a tight shot group. And what that means is, for those of you who are not marksmen, is that in a series of three shots, my shot group is very close together. It makes like a triangle, or sometimes they're all three touching. It's pretty awesome. So I keep that grouping tight on the target. Even if I'm mentally tired, I have an accurate shot group. But what I cannot do, according to the research that was conducted by the military, is make accurate decisions. Accurate shots, yes. Accurate decisions, not so much. And that doesn't seem like, well, is that a big deal? I don't know, who cares, you're at the range, right? So while my shot group might be perfect, I'm more likely to have a friendly fire accident. You hear what I'm saying, right? Like, I'm capable of the task, but the decision surrounding the task gets a little fuzzy. I'll shoot you three times dead center, but you might be the wrong guy. See where I'm going? I'm also a little concerned about the guy who has arranged safety on these studies. So how about something less scary than shooting people, okay? How about prescription drugs? Would you believe that doctors are more likely to prescribe unnecessary antibiotics later in the day? Would you believe that they are 13% more likely after the 13th appointment and 19% more likely after the 24th appointment? How about judges? Beacons of honor and justice. Surely they are reliable and even-handed, right? Absolutely. Nope. 
when they were studied, prisoners who appeared early in the morning to receive um, their parole, they received parole 70% of the time. And those who appeared before the judge later in the day only received parole 10% of the time. So all day long, this judge is using all of his glucose, all of his ATP to make these decisions, to release people back out into society. And toward the end of the day, it becomes easier to make the easier decision, which has less consequences to the public in his mind or her mind. So friends, decision fatigue also can wreak havoc on our personal lives. I want you to take a look at this little video clip and tell me if this is familiar to anyone. Maybe. <laughs> so, how's your day? Um, it's all right. You still all right? Yeah, I don't, I don't really want to talk about it if that's okay. Yeah, it's okay. Sure. I mean, something bad happened? Yeah, I, um, yeah, it was just, it was just, oh, it was just one of those days, you know, it was just a long day. Nah, yeah. What are we gonna eat? I don't care, you can decide. How about the little Moroccan bistro? Um, yeah, it's fine. You don't seem like you like it. I, it's fine. Fine. Well, we can, we don't have to go there if you don't want to go there. We can go to the, um, the Indian place. I, yeah, that works too. Alright. There's a lot of places, though. I don't really care. You probably might care once we get close, though. I mean, I'm just uh, just kind of throwing it out there. We can go. No, I, mean, I, I think I'm just whatever. I just I just want to go somewhere. I'm just kind of hungry. And right. if we could just go. Okay, no, that's cool. Sure, sure, why not? You going to wear those shoes? So are we going to go for the full entree? You just want to get some appetizers? Maybe make a couple stops? Yeah, seriously, I, I don't care. Oh, okay. Just asking. But yeah, I get it. You're just asking, but it's like 10,000 questions and all we're supposed to do is go out to dinner and I just need you to make a decision so we can just go out to dinner and this is ridiculous. Every time we go somewhere, where do you want to go? I don't know. I don't care. And then you criticize all of my questions. I'm done making decisions today. It was like eight questions. The tops. Oh. 10,000 questions. Oh my God. You know what? Just forget it. Can we just go home? Do you want to go home? <laughs> So this is familiar, right? Like, everyone can identify this. I'm pretty sure that I am not married anymore because of that situation right there. One too many times, right? So um, we're going we're gonna to talk a little bit how to solve this date night problem a little while later, I promise. So, oops, sorry. So we've established that decisions require fuel economy and brain power and smart utilization. So about this conundrum of 35,000 decisions a day, how do we ensure that we've got the fuel when it counts? So I have a few suggestions. First, I want you to make fewer decisions. You're like, what? This lady's telling me not to work, right? Not to do my job. Um, but who? if you picture the late Steve Jobs right now, what's he wearing? He is, isn't he? Always. That was his outfit, right? So great minds like him and Mark Zuckerberg and these guys, like, they wear the same stuff, all the Barack Obama, all the time, right? Because that's one less decision that they have to make in a day. No decisions were wasted on what outfit they were going to wear. It took me like 75 different outfits to find this, and I'm still un unhappy about it, right? So my closet actually looks like a clothing bomb went off, and it's really stressful in there. And my daughter, though has her closet, and it's all sorted out, and literally there's little stickers by every day, school day, what she's going to wear that day, so on Sunday night, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, she's got everything down to the under panties and the accessories, so we could all learn something from her, because she does not waste any of her decisions during the weekday when she needs it for school, which leads to the next strategy, have a plan. My buddy Kevin is constantly yelling this at our girls when they're playing basketball, have a plan! <laughs> um, but there is stuff that you can pre-plan for, and you should do it. So, like, in my life, um, eating is, 
stressful at our house. I feel like I have a giant Great Dane who's constantly wiping his face across the counter while I'm trying to make dinner and stuff. So I do all of the um, shopping lists and pre-planning and all those kinds of things um, on Sunday. Because if I am left to my own devices at 7 p.m. when it's time to make dinner on a weekday after I've done my 87 jobs that I do, we're eating cereal or fast food every day. So I, I, if we have a plan, this makes this easier. But consider clinically, right? How can I answer all of the what if questions and turn them into planned processes? So now instead of what if I can't intubate this difficult airway, what if it becomes if I can't intubate, then I'll move to this crack early. Having a mentally rehearsed, well-thought-out plan for emergencies eliminates the decisions that we must make and puts us on autopilot. The next is making big decisions early in the day. I just told you that you burn energy making decisions all day long and you make a ton of them, so the, do the important ones early. Don't wait until late in the day when you're vulnerable. And I'm a night owl, so this is difficult for me, right? I think I'm really smart at nighttime. And then I get up the next morning, read what I wrote the night before, and I'm like, whew, no, you are not smart. <laughs> Cognitive offload the stuff that you can. This is about making fewer decisions and about having a plan. So it kind of all is all encompassing here. So who uses checklists here? There was a whole bunch of EMS people. I better see some hands. So I use checklists, airway checklists, all day, right? I use checklists for everything. I use med calculators for everything. I use checklists for everything. I don't trust this brain anymore. I'm getting, I'm almost 40. Things are happening in there. So it's an opportunity to prevent yourself from making a critical error, from getting it wrong. So do this. Offload this responsibility to a checklist. Offload this responsibility to an app or whatever you're using to make critical procedures bulletproof. Next is delegate. Delegate, delegate, delegate. It's hard for control freaks. I don't, I mean, there's a few probably in here and I am 1000% one. It is hard to delegate responsibility to other people if you don't trust them because they're not you. They're not going to do it the way you would do it, but delegate to those people. The, this Getting rid of the less important stuff leaves you the ability to manage the things that matter. But if you are going to delegate, you must communicate. So a few years ago, I was doing this course wrap up with Scott Weingart. He's, it's okay for me to tell the story. He kind of sounds like an asshole in it, but he's told me it's okay. He was talking about decision fatigue and how he would get asked a million times a day to sign EKGs. And so he understood decision fatigue and he was like, I'm not gonna sign those anymore. You get to find the resident or the fellow. And my question was, does the nurse know why you're not signing those EKGs? And he said, no. And I was like, oh, okay, cool. She thinks you're an asshole. And I know this because I was an ICU charge nurse. And I can promise you that if I tracked down a doctor who said, go find the resident or the fellow, I would want to stab him in the eyeballs. I don't care about his decision fatigue. There's a patient coming from the OR. I got to get this one discharged and housekeeping to come and all those kinds of things, right? But the thing is, if you don't close the, I, once he explained that, and you and close the communication loop as to why he did, couldn't look at that EKG and the one after it and the one after it, it made way more sense to me. Then he was able to say, Ash, I need all this decision-making capability and this brain power for the real recess. Roger, got it, Chief. I want to ask you again. So close the loop as to why you're doing these things. Communicate with the people that you love, that you work with. So Daniel Kahneman, in Thinking Fast and Slow, talks about systems thinking, right? So system one thinking is that automatic, unconscious, easy decision stuff. And system two is effort, effortful thinking. It's conscious thought. It's complex decision making. So in Weingart's story, the EKG stuff, that's all to him. System one thinking, easy. Glance at it, no problem. Don't see a big deal, right? But every one of those EKGs was a matched burn. And then when it got to that recess, the system two thinking, he had nothing left. So I've been clamoring on about matches and decisions for a few minutes now, but now it's time for you to do some work. 
your stuff. In your tables, and if you don't have a table, find one, make a friend. I want you to talk for a few minutes um, about a couple of things. First, I want you to decide a complex clinical problem that requires a decision. And then I want you to create a solution for how to make that decision. So for example, if you were an, one of those aforementioned doctors who writes too many prescriptions for antibiotics, perhaps you and your group create a decision tree for how to make that decision. So two things, a clinical problem that uh, requires a, a decision and the strategy that you would use to go about that. Um, so grandma in the nursing home, right? This is a system two complex problem. If it's at the end of the stressful day, I need to be really mindful before I go in there ready to fire, get people fired and yank her, make some stupid knee-jerk decision to yank her out of there. Because then what, she's going to live with me? That's not going to work, right? So um, I don't want to make an impulsive decision, um, and I want to make sure that's really thought out. So I need to be really mindful. It may need immediate attention. I might not be able to put it off, but I need to be mindful of what my potential reactions might be going into that. So my buddy Mike, his slide deck, he said it was a raging dumpster fire. It's probably a system two. Can I look at those? Do I have the bandwidth to manage that today? Maybe not. I might hold off till Saturday or Sunday morning while I have my coffee and so that I can invest with my creative brain. I might just set that aside for a couple days. Hey, bro, I'll get back to you. My daughter in the basketball shorts, that's too easy. Delegate, right? Somebody that's actually in the same state as her today, right? So maybe her dad can bring her her basketball shorts. So that's, that's, we're going to not worry about that one too much. Tyler and the budget, I'm going to need to look probably closely at that tomorrow morning because math and I do not get along that well. And so I'm going to want to spend a little bit more time with that when I am fresh, nice and early in the morning for a big decision. Um, my fire chief, that's easy, right? Infectious disease goes through, an, um, through a protocol process down an algorithm, super easy. Open the book, it's like page 42, you open it, boom, 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 and we go down the algorithm. There's no decisions to be made there, just action. That's easy. The friend with the possible STD, um, that's a system two complex problem. I may or may not look at it. I, in fact, I'm going to delegate that one because vaginas really aren't my thing. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give that one away. Give that one up. So, and then Scott Weingart, um, well, he knows I always wait till the last minute for everything, so too late, bro. <laughs> um, here we are, talking about it. So, oh, oh and um, the, the wine one was very easy, right? It's hot in Texas, so it's going to be rosé all day. So last, um, I, pro I did promise you that we would talk about that date video. So that was actually my uh, colleague, Aaron, and I uh, making that video while we were talking about decision fatigue and... Um, and he's, he's pretty hilarious and owed to my, when I used to have hair, but whatever. Um, but make this thing in your life. So the work stuff is cool, the clinical stuff, make algorithms, we have tools, we have checklists, we do all these things. But in your personal life, have a plan, pre-plan. So whatever you're going to do in your life with your, with your special person, be that your significant other or your um, child or your... Um, parents or whatever that is, have a plan, pre-plan. What you'll eat, where you'll go, what you'll wear, what you'll, how that'll get done, who's driving, all of the things so that there's no way to fail. Be on autopilot for this. If you hear nothing else I say today, in fact, I would love it if you go home with that. Choose the person that you immediately thought of when you saw that video and giggled a little bit because you've been in that situation before and tell them we're going to do this differently in the future. Communicate with them why you're going to make these decisions in advance. Make those decisions in advance together, and then stick to that. Because um, it, that is, those are the kinds of decisions that are totally worth your time and energy. So I'm able to solve problems this way because of my routine. And it gets started um, every Sunday from my desk, Sunday evening, and I use these strategies to automate and plan for absolutely everything I can. Every morning, I sit at the same desk, and I make a list of five things today. The five things that need to happen today that are all within reach for the day. And at the end of the day, at the same desk, I do the same routine, only with wine instead of coffee, and I check the things off the list. And I don't get too upset with myself when I have to leave things behind on the list. I just add them to the list already for the next day. 
I don't waste mental energy beating myself up about it. The task just finds itself the top of tomorrow. And so I'm not claiming I am the role model for organization, right? You just heard me say my closet was a clothing bomb. But the science on decision fatigue is, is kind of marginal at best. But in your work and your personal life, some decisions will stay with you or they'll be uncertain. And some of you will have varying degrees of tolerance for that. But my hope is for you that with some awareness, which is what we've done here today, you'll be able to recognize your capacity for making good decisions and be educated and comfortable to verbalize to the people that you work with and the people that you care about when you're feeling suboptimal. And that's, ladies and gentlemen, decision fatigue for you. Thank you. Thank you.